radio of what they're seeing. Because you know, no one's put any spin on that information, no one's using it to their own end. So, very, very important, we have reconnaissance for the scouting vehicles. Now, traditionally for reconnaissance, we've had small, fast vehicles. Fast because the quicker you are on the battlefield, the harder you are for the enemy to hit with their guns. Small, again, you're a smaller target, and sometimes harder to see as well. So getting around quickly and fast, that's a defense mechanism. And the idea with a vehicle like this, you've actually got a crew of three in this vehicle. This one's called a Lynx, by the way. It's a Canadian vehicle, uh, made originally for the Canadian Army, then sold to European countries as well. This will have a crew of three in. At the moment, we can just see the driver with his head out the hatch. If this vehicle comes under fire at all from the enemy, He's got a lever on the side of his seat, he pulls that lever up, the seat drops down, and he drops down, closes his hatch, and he looks out of those glass periscopes you can see in front of him. Now you can look through some of those glass periscopes on a stand in the museum. The whole idea there, of course, if a bullet or something from a shell hits the glass, it may crack the glass, but nothing will come in and wound the driver or any other crew member or damage the vehicle. They've got quick release buttons on the side, out drops the old periscope, you put a new one in and off you go again, that's the idea. Downside of them, it's like looking at the world through a glass fish tank. It tends to distort the outside world. And that's why you'll often see vehicle drivers and commanders going into action with their heads out the turret till the last possible moment. Because one of the things they often don't tell you about armoured vehicles is the truth is in a closed down armoured vehicle, your visibility is pretty appalling. Very modern vehicles, they're even putting video cameras around the outside, so the guys inside have got more of an idea what's going on around them. Commander, he's the one with that round hatch half open at the moment, that's where he sits. He's got the binoculars, he's looking out for where the enemy are, what's the best route forward, and relaying that information to the third crew member who's a radio operator, they're inside the vehicle. And they get that information back to the main force commander. Now you can see this has got a thumping great machine gun on the top there, something they call a 50 caliber Browning machine gun. If this fires one of its bullets at your car, it will go through your engine block all the way through the front of the car, out the back, and won't hardly slow down at all. It is a very powerful machine gun. But on this vehicle, they tend to put it there really for a bit of moral support for the crew. Because if you bump into the enemy, quick burst machine gun fire, you back off quick. You're not there for fighting, you're there for gathering information. It's the tanks coming up behind you are there for the fighting, so don't hang around too long. The armour protection, this is made of aluminium, which is relatively a light metal. It'll stop a bullet, but not much else. So again, you don't want to be slugging it out with the enemy or hanging around too long because you're fairly vulnerable. And as you can all see, this is a track vehicle. Sometimes we have wheeled reconnaissance vehicles. And the general rule of thumb is wheels are quieter than track, so that's good for stealth. But actually, tracks can go to places that wheels just can't get to. They're noisier, but it does mean to say that you can go, they're more mobile than a wheeled vehicle. vehicle, like you'll see on a lot of vehicles in the museum, sometimes on the turret, sometimes on the front wings, there's these little banks of tubes. Now in each of those tubes is a smoke grenade. It's about the size of a coke can. And the idea is, if the vehicle comes under attack, driver or commander can press a button, out flies a pattern of smoke grenades in front of the vehicle, very quickly a big smoke screen built up, and you can manoeuvre back or off or out the way without the enemy seeing you. So again, it's a very simple but very good defensive mechanism to hide yourself from the enemy. And again, very useful if you're going to be the reconnaissance vehicle, you tend to be out the front of the main force, it's very likely you're going to be the people that bump into the enemy first. So hiding your withdrawal is a very useful uh, thing to have. Now they made the links to be amphibious. So it can actually cross inland water, lakes or rivers, uh, you wouldn't go in the sea with it, the first wave over the top would sink you like a stone. But it's again, it's another one of those useful features. Just the tracks going around will scoop up enough water to propel you across a river or a lake. And that means 
and of course you can find up, out what the enemy up to on the other side of the river if they've blown up the bridges, so quite important. At the moment in the British Army we've got uh, a tracked reconnaissance vehicle, in the past we've had wheels, that argument goes on all the time, um, what's best for doing that role. And fairly soon, within the next few years, we're going to have a fairly big new reconnaissance vehicle called Scout, that's up to 30 tonnes, so a very different vehicle from that one we just saw. Right, another type of vehicle, we will be seeing tanks, don't worry a bit later on, but uh, another type of vehicle now, looks similar to that first one, but this one's got a very different role on the battlefield. If you've seen our trench diorama with that last remaining Mark I First World War tank, you can see that's going forward and crushing the barbed wire, and our soldiers, the British soldiers, are marching along behind it to get in the German trenches without getting held up. Now the top speed of that first tank is about three miles an hour, four miles an hour with wind behind you. That's about marching pace. It didn't want to go much faster than that because it didn't want to lose the soldiers it's leading across the battlefield. Now by the Second World War, tanks are doing many more things. They're not just battering rams. They're doing many more things on the battlefield and they're doing all that much faster. So country style building vehicles to put the soldiers in the back to keep up with the tanks. And when this vehicle was built in the 1960s, pretty much every some country that built a tank built a box on tracks like this one to go forward and take the soldiers into action. Now this particular vehicle, this is called FV 432 Fighting Vehicle 432. Sometimes vehicles get nice names, sometimes they seem to get lumped with a production number. Now the 432 started service in the end of the 1960s, it's still in service with the British Army today. You may just have seen one drive past us about five minutes ago. So it's a really long-serving vehicle in the British Army. It starts life as an armoured personnel carrier, in other words carrying the soldiers in the back, but they've used it for lots of other things as well. Some were made into engineer carrying variants, they had mortars in, some were used as command posts, some as ambulances. Because it's a very basic vehicle. You've got the engine at the front next to the driver. He's got that square hatch that's open at the moment. Again, if he comes under fire, drops his seat down, looks out of the periscope. Commander sits behind. Sometimes they fit a machine gun there to put down suppressing fire on the enemy. And the section of eight soldiers are on bench seats in the back. So it's really just like a square box in the back there where the soldiers go. Big door on the rear. And the army sometimes calls these battle taxis. They're for taking the soldiers across the battlefield to where the fighting is. They don't fight from inside this vehicle, they jump out the door and they finish the attack on foot. Now, these 432s, the ones that are still in service, like many armoured vehicles nowadays, they don't scrap them, they send them back to the factories, so they get them upgraded. So they've got new engines, new gearboxes, and like many modern army vehicles, if they go off to fight, that's when they bolt all that extra armour and protection, sometimes electronic countermeasures, all sorts of extra bits on the outside, and that's what the military call Theatre Entry Standard, or TES. That's what it looks like when it goes to war, when it's back here training, it's almost like a pared-down bare vehicle with very little extras put on it.